Uh, this is your place. Um, I'll try to keep everything very brief as we get established. So uh, yoav has been doing quite a lot of work with responsive images of late. Um, he's heavily involved in the responsive images community group. Uh, then we have uh, Peter Miller. So Peter Miller is a developer, works on a lot of uh, heavy uh, content-heavy websites, image-heavy websites, so great experience. Um, Ann Robinson um, writes, also works, works for Yammer. Yammer. Sorry, I forgot. Um, has written fantastic stuff about web performance, has some great ideas about how we can address some of the responsive images problems using progressive JPEGs. Um, Estelle Whale, um, has everyone heard of the clown car technique, the creator? So we're going to hopefully talk a little bit about that. Um, and John Miller works for Google. Um, and John Miller is probably the only person on Earth who can tell you the difference between a device pixel, the, uh, a real pixel, a CSS pixel, and <laughs> all sorts of other pixels. <laughs> so, and he can do it all in his head. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> so um, first up, we have Yoav, who's going to give a 10-minute talk, um, basically outlining what the current solutions are that we've been basically discussing for, for the last two years, trying to come up with a solution for responsive images. Take it away. So we'll swap seats. So hi, um, as Mark just said, I'm uh, Yoav Weiss. I'm here to talk about uh, responsive images. I'll try to uh, sum up uh, two years of discussions into 10 minute talk, so bear with me. So first in the mid 2000s, all we had was mobile only sites. Um, they were kind of lame with the very slim content. Uh, highly optimized images. Um, it got a little better with the iPhone, but it's it wasn't that hot. Um, then responsive web design became a thing, and uh, which was very cool. One code base to rule them all. You can serve all of the devices through a single site. But um, the problem is. Um, it was kind of slow. Uh, it became a synonym to slow mobile websites, um, which is a problem. <laughs> so um, the reason is that most sites serve the same resources to both mobile and desktop. Um, and most of that data is images. So. Um, there are a lot of savings to be made. Um, what I wrote a utility which K Tim Cadillac run. Tim Cadillac is a developer. Sorry for name dropping. Um, uh, but basically, we saw that up to 72% of the image data can be saved for some of the viewports in some of the cases. There's, so there's a lot of savings to be made. And Retina only makes things worse because the gap between the smallest viewport, uh, smallest images you want to send, and the highest resolution images you want to send is getting bigger. And for with most devs owning Retina devices, most devs are sending high resolution devices to uh, high resolution images to all devices. Um, so. This is the responsive images problem, which we like to divide into two major use cases. The first one is resolution switching, um, serving different images to different devices, um, different dimension images, different devices. The images are the same images, uh, same proportions. They're not cropped. But basically, the quality is different. Um, this is one example of that. And it can be further divided into DPR switching, serving retina only image retina images only to retina devices, and viewport switching, which is adapting the 
image dimensions to the actual uh, display to to the size that in which they will be displayed. Um, then the other major use case is R direction. Basically, it's content optimization without wasting too many bytes. It's matching the images to the layout uh, in a way that makes sense, so either a crop or different proportions or something that works according to the actual responsive uh, breakpoints. Um, from a survey we ran, a lot, of developer, a lot of developers are already doing that using hacks, so this is a major use case. Um, and so we've talked about the problem. Let's talk about the solutions. There are several proposed standard solutions. Um, there's the source set attribute, um, picture element, client hints, header, and I put a question mark in because it's not really a standard solution. This is just a proposal at the moment, but the responsive image container. I'll talk about each one. In detail, so source set, basically it's the same old image tag now with new attribute that can include multiple resources according to the DPR and the viewport. It's a slightly controversial statement, but it addresses mainly the resolution switching case and much less the art direction case. Some people would disagree, but... Um, the current implementation, SourceSet is currently implemented in WebKit and in Blink. It's behind a flag in Blink, and it's not yet shipped in WebKit, but it's there in the code base. Firefox will soon follow. And uh, basically, it looks something like this. Um, there's the, you specify the 1x or 2x or 1.5x or 3x qualifiers for each image resource you add to the you add to the page um, the entire spec also includes viewport switching which uh, looks something like this um, it's um, for each resource you specify the max viewport for which it can be applied to and the uh, x factor that's adapted to it the problem with that it, it gives you a lot of expressive power, but you also have to, in some cases, like you can see in the example I put up, you have to define the URL, a, a single URL several times because it fits several um, DPR and viewport combinations. Uh, then we have picture, which is mainly targeted at our direction. It specifies, uh, it has, it's an element with multiple source children. Each one of them is specifying uh, an image resource based on media queries and possibly type. Uh, and the first matching resource is downloaded and displayed. Um, it looks something like this. And as you can see, it can mix source set into the source elements. So you can define an R-directed image with multiple uh, DPR versions of it. And the, um, the media attributes you use here are m most probably the same media, uh, media values that you use for your layout breakpoints, unlike resolution, um, viewport resolution switching, which can be independent of the layout viewport. Um, then we have, as a third contender or third proposal, we have client hints that is, unlike the two others, it's not a markup-based uh, solution, it's an HTTP-based solution. And basically, the client sends out its capabilities, it's, it sends out hints to the server saying, this is my DPR, this is my viewport width or height, or the, the actual values are still debated, but this is the general spirit. And the, uh, everything is done on the server side. It's server logic that serves one resource or the other. And one recent change to that proposal is that it's opt-in only. The hints are not sent on the first HTML request. On the other hand, it saves up uh, from it saves us from adding 
uh, data to requests where the server is not going to do anything about it. So that's a recent compromise that may be able to push the spec forward. Um, then I have something I I'm proposing as more of a long-term solution. This is not something that's on anyone's immediate radar, but it's a long-term solution I'm proposing. That's a file format-based approach, where basically each resolution, each target resolution that we want to serve is represented in a layer in some sort of a container. And these layers are building up uh, one on top of the other so that the browser can download a certain number of layers then and then add more layers on that, enhancing the quality of the image. Uh, it can address both resolution switching and art direction. And I'll just uh, show you a bunch of examples. So basically, for resolution switching, we have this photo that if we look into the layers that compose it, it's a thumbnail, then an enhancement layer, which is basically the thumbnail upscaled with a diff from the original image downscaled. So an enhancement layer and another one that's basically used to recreate the original image with, without adding uh, many bytes to the process. There is no. The overhead is very small. And for our direction, the same can be applied. So this bigger image that's used everywhere for our direction can be split into a crop, then uh, an enhancement layer, and another one. Um, the advantages are, the, is the, are that markup is not touched. Uh, you have a single file per image, so it's easy to maintain. And the best one for me is that the browser can just download diffs if they had downloaded one image and then the something in the browser's environment have changed. You can download the diff. Um, the disadvantages are that it's complicated to implement. And basically, the coding performance and network performance without HTTP2 is currently a mystery. We need to further investigate that in order to know if it's feasible or not without HTTP2 and with, in terms of the coding performance. And last minute slides added by John Meller here. Maybe you want to talk about that. So a possible way of making this responsive image format container load more efficiently. Um, when you're down, when you're making sort of several range requests or something, and you don't leave get, leave gaps between, wait for a round trip each time, um, we load all the images on the page um, in parallel, um, progressively. So, I've taken out your web website. I've stolen this. So, um, on the left you see the images being loaded one by one sequentially. On the right you see the images being loaded in all in parallel. Um, it's the same progressive JPEGs on both sides, just that on on the left, I'm truncating the, the stream of images so that you get the first image and then I truncate at some point there. On the right, I truncate all the images at the same percentage. So this is 5% of the image, image bytes. And you can see that on both sides, the page doesn't look great. But by the time you've got to 10% of the image bytes, um, already on the right, you can kind of see what the page looks like. All the images are really blurry and so on, but they at least sort of fill their space well. Whereas on the left, you can see sort of the top left, you can see the start of the top left image, but all the other images haven't even started loading yet. Um, as you gradually load more, um, say you're on. In front of them. Okay. Say you get to 25%, for example. Now that the page on the right, um, we've only loaded a quarter of the image bytes, but it already starts to look okay. Um, the images aren't crisp but they're still perfectly usable. Whereas on the left, we have this super crisp, lovely image on top left, but the other images haven't even started loading. Um, by the time you get to sort of 50%, um, the page on the right now looks perfect. You can, you can almost not tell that it hasn't finished loading the images. Whereas on the left, again, we've only got half the images. Um, and then as you load more bytes, 
the page on the right gradually becomes like a super crisp retina beautiful page, but it's a very subtle difference between that and the 1x image. Whereas on the, on the, on the left, do you, only now, at 100%, do we actually have all the images at all visible. <coughs> um, yeah? great. This is yeah. great. I'm, I love that you're, you're giving something you know, to the users like while they're waiting. That's, that's brilliant. Um, that's what I love about progressive JPEGs is that it will download the first scan uh, as soon as possible. So I think that that's kind of a good lead into the first question that we have, which is from uh, Jake uh, Archibald. I hope I pronounced that right. <laughs> um, Jake, do you have your question with you? Yes, mic runner, please. There goes Pete. <laughs> He's going to be really slim by the end of the day. <laughs> hey. Um, okay. So I currently send like a, a two times or two point five times image and just compress the hell out of it. And the, the file size is, you know, kind of roughly the same as as a one one x image. And that that seems to to do the job. You know, why do we, why do we need all these extra markup examples? And if the, in the future John's solution can come in and and stop the download at some point, I mean, surely that's all we need. So the rest to start John. So should we start with the difference between fixed width and flexible width images? Um, so this ties into what Yav was saying earlier about resolution switching. There's two kinds. There's DPR switching, where your image is a fixed size, like a logo or an icon. Um, it's going to be the same width, say 32 pixels on all devices. And all you need to do is sw switch it out based on the device's pick screen density. So you might need a 2x image on a retina screen, a 3x image on like Samsung Galaxy S4, that kind of thing. But all you're doing is changing it based on the device pixel ratio. With a flexible width image, say you've got width 100%, um, then suddenly the width for the viewport of the device matters. And so your phones, your tablets, your, your laptops, they all have different widths. They all need different images. Um, and here, a, a simple technique which gets you up to double the resolution of an image um, by compressing it more heavily isn't going to scale to sort of an eight times bigger image. Cool. So, um, what do you think? Yes. Uh, one more thing. Um, regarding the compressive images um, hack. Explain uh, what the uh, compressive images are. Uh, what uh, Jake was uh, talking about. Basically, taking the high res images and uh, compressing them, uh, ex extremely compressing them, so that they will be, when downsized, to a to a one x uh, display dimensions, they will still look good, and also for Retina, uh, they look quite fine because the actual display dimensions are. Hang on, sir. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a few. I'm seeing a few kind of people looking at you going. So let's let's so let's see if we can explain that a little better. Does anyone have a gonna have a go at explaining a little better? I, mean, I can try. So somebody, um, hello, somebody discovered that um, if they like keep the resolution really high on an image, but they um, put the compression down to, I think, zero. Is that correct? That's correct. So they'll actually get a smaller file size that is higher resolution, and it looks good um, on retina images, as then you have a smaller file size for, you know, for, for speed. So it's actually best of both worlds, and it's kind of like an amazing discovery. Yeah. So we're just going to, we're like, I'm sure if we like go back to like 1996, we might find the same thing. But who knows? Because we were like doing it for modems and stuff anyway. So I guess what what I'm wondering is, you know, what might be some of the side effects? Because we're sending like, you know, like four times the data, right? Like basically the sending image is two times or even more bigger yeah. than this size. It might be like three times. Yeah. So can the browser really handle that? Like, you know, do we know if there's side effects within the browser? Um, yeah, maybe question. maybe John's in a good position because he's closer to to Chrome. <laughs> we don't really have to research yet. Um, so yeah, it's going to take four times the memory um, on an image-heavy page that might blow your mem memory budget, and suddenly things like painting and scrolling might get slower. It's it's hard to know. Um, we need more research, basically. Right. Yeah, we need to experiment with that, but it's a super interesting idea. Yeah, basically, it's on the agenda to do some to get some real hard data on the. Imp Implications of that, but uh, on, the agenda, on the agenda of who? On the agenda, on the responsive image because images community groups agenda to get some hard data on that for the DPR switching case. But uh, exactly as John said, it doesn't cover all the cases, 
and it can cause decoding performance and memory issues. So if you're using that, you need to, to test it well to make sure there are no problems. So because wanna, we don't have I wanna general bounce data. A question. So I'm going to bounce a question to, to Peter Miller, because he's kind of like, you know, he, he's working on a lot of, like you work on some fashion websites, and you've done like which, uh, anyway, for, for whichever ones, like, um, obviously you'd have access to the very high resolution pictures that are coming straight for photographers. Um, what would this mean for maybe you guys? Would it mean anything? Well, I think that, um, well, first of all, I think I've, I've looked at the solution and I've got a Retina MacBook. And I think it's, it's still a matter of um, subjective opinion, maybe, about whether this does look as good as, as real Retina images or yep. Flex images. Um, but I think possibly thinking about it e even today is, is the bigger problem that, OK, well, we can send these kind of pseudo 2x images down to, to be shrunk down at 50%. But what happens when we maybe want to expand those images or have them be more of a percentage width? And then suddenly, we're actually showing those highly com compressed 2x images yep. at their 1x size, at their physical 1x size. Yep. And, and then maybe they look even worse. Okay. I think whenever we have this debate, we also still have to remember the people who, are have, who have metered bandwidth, because yeah, on your MacBook Pro, on your Wi-Fi, it's going to be great. But someone doesn't want to download that when they're paying nineteen dollars for. I mean, so I yeah, absolutely. So, but let's let's hold on that one okay. because that one takes us off to like the following question. So okay. I want to not go into like those exact concerns because what uh, what Anne originally said was like you can make a larger image that's actually smaller in kilobytes than so in in a, in a sense it. It doesn't really apply, but it does. But we're getting to exactly but to the point. We also have to make. think about Android 2.4 and older Androids, which are still being sold today, because yeah, they don't have the memory capacity. Right. Even Firefox OS is like 250 megabytes of RAM on that, and it's like you know it struggles. You know, um, so absolutely. So anyone want to? I think we should probably move on to the yes next topic. Um, so the uh, second question. Um, is there a George Crawford? Hi, this is one of the anonymous questions from Google Moderator. Is DPI negotiation only a stopgap? Bandwidth keeps growing exponentially, LCD prices are dropping, GPUs benefit from Moore's law. In several years, will it make sense to just send high resolution images to all users? So. I mean, um, the implications are, you know, this goes back, you know, if we look at all the computing history, right? Um, you know, well, 64K be enough, and, you know, more slow, the computers just get faster, and yet we kind of seem to find ourselves in the same situation over and over again. Like back in 1996, like I was saying before, it's like we had modems and we had to send compressed the crap out of images then as well to cater to users that were just getting cable and who didn't have cable and still were on 54K. And uh, 54 volt rate modems, blah blah. So, thoughts. Um, you know, should we really worry that much? Should we stop caring? <laughs> Who, I, I know everybody's really excited. So, <laughs> make let's 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 do a round, but uh, and bounce back if we can. But uh, let's keep it short. Okay. I mean, I think that it would be nice if we could just send super large images, um, but I don't think we can do that quite yet. And I think that. The, um, the responsive images, um, it's such a topic because we're getting smaller and slower and we're getting bigger and faster at the same time, right? So this is spreading out. So, um, so yeah, I have obviously my opinions, but I think that we need um, a responsive images container. Could be possibly a progressive JPEG that has like really small scans and really large scans and uh, um, possibly the browser only downloads what it needs. Sweet. We have a delegate in the queue. I'll just get Mike uh, Petridge ready. Um, well, if you can jump to a, to a mic, Mike. Uh, and, uh, so Pete, do you want to quickly jump in on, on this? Well, I think um, staying in a hotel room in New York City, it actually feels like we're quite a few years away from being uh, <laughs> fast, very fastly connected across everywhere. Yeah. But also, you know, you've got to think uh, data plans, roaming. You want to give the users maybe an option to have a low resolution mode, but if we're just always sending that high resolution. But also allowing for 
And the art direction case, I don't think that this caters for that. Um, I think that as Anne started to say, uh, I think that Moore's Law is not giving us uh, and um, expanded bandwidth. I mean, we get a larger range of devices. We have uh, capable smaller devices, and uh, and the bandwidth coverage is not ubiquitous. So basically, it's a question that asks us whether we can look into the p future, and unfortunately, we can't. But I don't think it may. In well, we can, 20 years, can, it may be irrelevant. Well, we, we can, we, I mean, we can't look into the future, but we can see what the trends are, right? You know, we yeah. know, like, that we have now, like, Google Glass and, you know, Samsung's uh, watch and things like that. So, exactly. in a sense, we know a little bit where machines are going. And again, we're going to see the same cycle. So, yeah. And uh, so basically, the problem is getting worse. Yeah. <laughs> so, we found Mike. Do you, want, yep, do you want to jump in? Yeah, um, just a quick question about, so I, I'm, one of you mentioned uh, what if you have a small image, I mean, using high compression at a large size that was initially seen small but then expanded. Uh, it seems to be a consequence of the actual form, the JPEG format. What about new formats such as WebP that, um, and using things like that? So maybe I'll get John to respond to, to that one. So I'm not an expert on WebP, but um, yeah, it tends to give, it seems to have two things that are nice. Um, <coughs> it gives slightly better performance and compression performance, ranging from like 25 to 60, or it depends what you're doing with it. But it also, when very highly compressed, um, you get less of the sort of blocking artifact you get with JPEG. So you can actually afford a greater compression ratio than you would use with JPEG. Um, so that can help, but the ratio of bells is support and so on, of course. Also, with WebP, <coughs> perceived performance is like slower than progressive JPEG, right? Because um, you're actually, you know, getting a scan earlier than a WebP. Even if the even if a WebP is a smaller file size, progressive JPEG is going to beat it every time. Is it, am, am I right to somebody can correct me here, but I, it doesn't support progressive loading. Or um, does it? You know, that's a good question. No, there's I no account support for progressive no. loading. So I think that's a, like at least from Mozilla's perspective, uh, following the the bug about WebP, that's a real showstopper for us. We correct. Yeah. So, um, so uh, just uh, I'm not sure a future progressive WebP can answer that or a progressive JPEG, but basically I think that it's not a question of image format because we have progressive image formats, or we can easily. Uh, come up with like the responsive image container stuff. We can easily. It's a prototype, but it's not something. It's not complicated to get this done. Uh, the problem is that currently there are no fetching mechanism in place that can download only the start of the image for s low resolution devices and download the entire image for high resolution uh, devices that have the bandwidth and have the capability to decode it. And I think that getting the fetching mechanism in place is would be an enabler for such a, for such optimization for such formats to so I wanna, be useful. I want to quickly get uh, still thoughts on all this. So <laughs> I was, you know, going back to the original question. I th I think we're never going to be able to just have one image solution, which is why I think I because. You don't want to have the same image if your device is this big versus if your image is this big. For those listening to audio, you don't want to have the same image if you have a, a 20 inch image versus a half inch image. But we or actually could do that, right? Because with a progressive JPEG, you have you can have a variable number of scans, and the scans are of increasing quality. So you could have, say, 40. <laughs> like, let's expand our minds about this. Like. Is that is that correct? Like we could okay. It's don't don't. If you're getting into forty times bigger zone, you will get color distortion. Well, well, no, but I mean, well, I'm, I'm talking about the art direction. If you're going to oh, so I'm um, yeah. Uh, well, putting the art direction um, topic aside for a second, you actually can have like a progressive JPEG that has a very small scan and then you know the very high resolution. So you can have a tiny image that downloads very quickly, and you can have. A super large HD image for yeah, but I don't, uh, 
I think we can't put the art direction aside because we are serving so many different devices. So I think to answer the question, the answer to the question is, I don't think serving one image will be the solution in the end because we are reaching such a so the, I mean, this is a, I mean, it's, um, we're gonna kind of continue to, the, the next question is very much related to this. So I'm gonna, um, before I do that, I'm gonna queue up uh, Kyle. Um, Kyle, do you have a mic already? Where's Kyle? Oh, sorry, uh, sorry, Kyle Simpson. He's over there. So I'm gonna queue up Kyle. Um, he's right there. So Kyle, just a quick question or comment. Um, so a lot of these solutions seem to be s sort of art direction centric, like I want the best possible images that can be there. But uh, responsive seems to respond to maybe the screen size, maybe to the bandwidth, but it doesn't seem to react to the environment. Say, if I start out loading a Flickr page that the battery power is at you know 50%, I've got plenty of processing power, but if I'm now at 2%, maybe the device should start you know choosing not to render these higher things. So can't we have solutions that allow apps to respond to more complex situations than just the screen size? So a quick, uh, we're gonna cover that as well, So, but somebody wants to make a quick comment? Um, just a quick comment. Um, that's something that certainly should be possible with the, when we're talking about resolution switching, when we're talking about things that won't break the layout, but just would give the, the, the user a lower quality image when it can't download the high res quality image. And this is something that should be heuristically possible with SourceSet. So the browser in SourceSet basically, uh, the spec contains a, an asterisk uh, saying, eventually the browser can do whatever the hell it wants. So, uh, so the browser can decide based on user preference, based on environment, based right, but on battery, the, but, but to not download the high res images, but the lower res yeah, ones. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of a good thing and a bad thing, but it does mean uh, it's a declarative model. You're handing over control. You're saying to the browser, this is what I got. Deal with it. Do it best for the user. Yeah, I don't think this should be something decided by the by the web developer because I don't think they have this yeah, kind of information. We and we cannot have this kind of information available to the web developer. This so is something that yes. should be done by the browser with the user preference. Agreed. Right. So I'm gonna inter I'm gonna be moderator here. I jump over to the next question because they're all related anyway. So we're <laughs> kind of basically those are the points. Um, Calvin uh, Spielman. Your question. So, runner? <laughs> yeah, um, I was basically wondering about if we are fighting a losing battle by continually generating all these different image sizes and different resolutions up front when there's constantly new devices, constantly different sizes. Um, we, we're, we're always going to be constantly trying to catch up and generating more and more images. <laughs> Uh, as opposed to having some service side solution that does it dynamically and optimizes the set of images we have. So th I think this ties in kind of beautifully to the stuff that John was presenting before and also to the progressive JPEG, uh, well, to, to, to having those multiple scans. So John, with the kind of work that you've been doing, you know, what are you seeing? What are the numbers basically telling you there? So. Uh, I guess there's two aspects of this question. Uh, on the server side, um, sure, you don't want you don't want um, the, the artist to be manually saving out like 20 different versions of every image. It's not scalable. Um, so uh, I guess on the server side, you, you kind of have to be at the, mo at the moment dynamically creating these images by automatically resizing them. Um, but then uh, I guess I'm like this as well. It would be nice if there was only one image you have to save. Like you just you just told your your, your your Photoshop or whatever, save out one ultra high resolution image and the browser downloads just the beginning of it, um, like however much it needs. Yeah, that's perfect. I think that's the most elegant solution. I think that the second most elegant solution is like with client hints um, and having the server like serve up different resolutions, um, different versions of the image, but it has to be automatic. Like we should not be creating, you know, X number of images, um, you know, to, to um, to serve to, to different devices, and and we are losing. You know, we are like fighting a, a losing battle in that in that case. I think the 
quick audience, did you have a question? Yeah, I mean, hey. But if you have that situation, aren't you going to end up in the thing that all the developers were complaining about when the operators started to compress your images on mobile networks and they sort of say, just get out of my way, I don't want you to touch my stuff. If you've got some automated system that sits between the thing, you're, you're creating the, the same problem that three years ago you're all whinging about. Uh, uh, my thought was that this would be, uh, I think it should be server side so that the developer is actually deciding what you're s sending over. Uh, not The browser should not be altering images, is my thought. But the developer doesn't know the bandwidth of the, of the client. No, I mean, with client, when we're all said and done, with when we have client hints and everything else, it should be the server that's making the 20 Im images and serving the correct image based on the client hints or the source set, not the browser that's taking an image and deciding that the upper left-hand corner should be shown instead of the middle of it. It seems a lot easier for the, for the browser to take the user's preference into account, though. Like, if the user decides that they want, they want they're roaming or something and they, they only want the very low resolution image, then do you want like an extra client hint saying I'm roaming, an extra client hint saying these kind of things? No, the, the, the browser can say, you can change, like when you have client hints, I guess I'm, should we ask the question about client hints that we're going to ask later? <laughs> no, because I think we're, I mean, we are talking about, like we, I don't think we need to move to, to, move to that question yet, okay. because we are kind of dealing with the, or discussing a, a very serious problem, which is, you know, A, how can computers really decide this? How do we set the, the breakpoints, or not even the breakpoints, but that, you know, this looks good here, so send this, and so on. So having that level of control, which was, uh, so as, as Steve was saying before, it's like that was pissing people off, developers, because it didn't look good. And to some degree, you know, well, that's what we really need to look at. Can we computationally do that? And John's research seems to suggest that it can because you do get a, at least the user gets the initial uh, layout with the nice images or beginnings of a nice image, and then from there you start progressively improving it. So how much you need to push it and what does that mean on the server, it's kind of hard to know. Um, my opinion on this is that basically you need all solutions to be automizable, so you can do either dynamic or a build step or something on the server side that does all the grunt work for you as a developer. But I don't think, uh, at least, we must have some solutions that don't require it. So, so I interject, so I got two questions from the floor. I got one from, uh, sorry, your name? Oh, sorry, okay. I thought you, uh, so, okay, there, go ahead. So I thought you were uh, gonna ask a question, <laughs> no problem, go ahead. So if we start generating 20, 30 different versions of files uh, on the server side um, and start doing very client hint headers or whatever, are we gonna have problems where the edge caches just can't keep all of these? I mean, we're gonna be blowing out 20 different times the number of files on all the edge caches. Are CDNs gonna be useful anymore at that point? Um, how's it gonna scale? Uh, I think edge ca since the very, very woodwork since the client hints is uh, one hint per header, so very would work. But I think the edge caches will have to adapt to the new reality of much more images than before. But since I don't think this will be a, it may be exponential, but there will be time to adapt. I mean, as far as the edge caches go. So I, that's my opinion. Hang on, hang on don't, don't speak without the, the mic. Um, so I was gonna jump to, um, so I'll go to Matt. I think you had a question, no, you're good? Okay, cool. So uh, Peter, you're looking like you wanna say something. Well, I mean, uh, when, the originally, when the original question was first asked, the, the case that comes to my mind is still the art direction case because it is very important for publications that I work on. Um, the, the crop has to be right and when you're, and that's why we do do upfront generation. We, we have picture editors and they are in charge of saying, when this image is displayed at, at this size, then here's a, here's a crop I want. Um, but I've worked with content management systems in the past that will define that given coordinates. So yes, we can automatically uh, resize images dynamically, but maybe we could allow picture editors to, to dynamically come in and draw some coordinates for different use cases in different contexts. And about the, the question about whether 
it's the browser that decides it or, or it's the developer that decides it. Absolutely, I think it has to be the browser that decides it. It's not just the, the resolution of the screen. It's not just the size of the screen. It's not just the battery power. It's actually everything else to do with what's rendering that, that image element. And it's not just the HTML. It's a style sheet as well. So this, I mean, this leads beautifully to the next question, which is um, by Jeffrey Selman. Is he here? There he is. Thank you. So this is a, an annoying theoretical purity question uh, supplied by the moderator. And I have a complicated relationship to it because since 1998 I've been beating the drum for separation of presentation and structure, but I'm also a big supporter of Matt Marcus and uh, picture. Hey, buddy. Is it problematic that we describe the presentation of images in markup against our typical mantra to separate presentation from content? And if so, does the specification of a myriad of sizes make this worse? So we, we saw this. Um, hopefully, you had the same kind of gut reaction when you saw both source set and picture and went, when, like when you saw the code up on the screen. And you kind of went, ugh. Really? We have to type all those times one and times two. And you saw picture like bloats like all over the place. And it has media queries in it as well. So this goes straight to, to you know, I know Jeffrey didn't ask the question specifically. But um, like he said, it's like it's bad because we are putting media queries into our markup. Um, you know, what can we do there? Is there possible solutions? Um, so, so the reason that there's a difference between images and background images is because the image tag IMG is a foreground image, it's content, versus all the design that we have on the web page. Right. So yes, we do have to keep it, it the image is actually content. Right, but what about the media query component? The media query should be, I mean, that's why we're trying to come up with all these different solutions yep. and why the picture element and the source set look so ugly. And actually, why I like the clown car technique is it, it actually separates out um, the content. Do you wanna, so just for people who don't know the clown car technique, just like a super, super Twitter size. OK, um, <laughs> three tweets. Um, it's basically, instead of using uh, pulling in an image, it pulls in an SVG, and inside the SVG, that's where all the media queries are. So it pulls in the correct image based on the container of the SVG. Uh, and it f works fairly well. It's basically a stopgap solution while we're trying to figure out the correct solution. But the reason that I liked the clown car technique is because it actually separated out content from presentation, from behavior, from images. I think it absolutely is a problem that we're defining the media queries in the HTML. I don't think it's a problem of bloat. That's fine. I think we can give the HTML all the sources of the images, as I was saying before. But it's. The, I think the problem is illustrated in the case where, let's say, on a 500 pixel um, wide screen, virtual pixels, um, you have an, an image at 100% width. On a 700 pixel screen, you might actually have that image at 50% width because you've got a second column come in. And OK, fine, uh, when I'm writing the HTML, maybe I'll take that into mind. But what if it's not an HTML generation problem? What if it's a, a render problem where um, I, if when a user's logged in, then you have a sidebar. But when they're not, you don't. And in CSS, I can have the, the column at 50% um, or 100% if it's got a, a sibling with the logged in sidebar. Um, but I'm going to want a different image source to apply to that element. And that's why a technique that takes into account the actual width of the image element rather than the width of the screen, I think, is absolutely essential. And, and that's why I do still have a problem with the picture element. So the, I, I, I think you yeah, will uh, come in and... Yeah. So, uh, this, is, <laughs> so this, is, this is alluding to some people might have heard uh -huh. about um, element queries. Yeah. Um, which are kind of like CSS applied to a particular container element. And it's like, it's pretty cool. It's a cool. It has its problems. Yeah. It has its problems. So, uh, so uh, actually, there are s several questions here. <laughs> First, for the separation of uh, content and uh, presentation, I think it's a problem. I think that uh, this is something that can be resolved by drying out the media queries out of HTML and into some sort of a media query variable. So drying out being? Uh, don't don't repeat yourself. Uh, okay. Thank you. uh, just um, 
basically creating variables that say mobile or whatever that means or um, basically create named media queries and use them instead of the actual media queries wherever you have media queries in your markup so be it picture or external style sheets yeah. and uh, or in the CSS as well yeah. there is work in the CSS working group regarding that I have no idea when it will go in but people are working on it and so regarding that I think that will resolve most of the issues from this separation of concerns point of view so regarding so my, hang on so like a question I have is like okay so with you know picture is probably the the main offender here um, you know should we you know should we even bother continuing work to work on it in that sense I don't think picture is the most visible offender but again there are style sheets there will if I'll have my way uh, media attributes will be everywhere which I probably won't have my way but <laughs> uh, but I think that there are a lot of resources that can be downloaded based on media and uh, I, I don't I think we need to have some some shortcut for media queries that we don't have to repeat them everywhere including in CSS because in CSS we repeat them as well it's true and regarding the element queries stuff first of all I'd like to say that the main advantage of the clown car technique versus basically anything else is that it basically emulates element queries the media queries there refer to the viewport of the SVG not the viewport of the document so while it it creates some delay in download it's sometimes necessary to I mean there are cases where it's useful extremely useful um, but the problem with element queries is that you cannot start downloading the resource before you have layout which means you add a significant delay uh, to the to the entire page load so and do you have any uh, any comments about um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm still a fan of um, progressive JPEGs, and I think that uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no, I think that, uh, that there's definitely like um, you know the art direction case. It doesn't really handle, obviously, um, but I don't think that we should forget about it as a file format that we might explore. Um, and we often do forget about progressive JPEGs. I think we forgot about progressive JPEGs for like ten years. <laughs> you know, we just. So what, 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 what is the reason we forgot about them? Um, who's, uh, what I, browser doesn't really support them now? Oh, <laughs> um, I mean, I think that you know, in general, there's there's pretty good browser support. I think that um, I think that the reason browsers don't support them is because we stopped using them, and I think we stopped using them because um, because things changed. We had you know faster connections, um, but then things kind of reverted with mobile, and we went back to where we were, where where speed turned out to be an issue again. Um, so so yeah. Um, cool. <laughs> that's it. Um, so there's one question from the audience. Um, go ahead. Sound like the best solution for the picture element is to move the basically to move the rules to CSS. You can go back to regular IMG and have something that says in CSS like for all images which have a path that looks like this, then apply these rules to add dot two x to the path. This allows you to, to move the more presentational parts of it to the CSS while still keeping the content, namely the fallback image, in the HTML. And if you have, if you can do something like a regex to not have to write this two x, that two x, something else two x for two x versions of every single image you have. So um, and you can sort of do this right now using attribute selectors and IMG tag. Using what selectors? You can sort of do this now using attribute selectors. And attribute get, selectors. Yeah, but once per once per SRC, which will be annoying. Right. So yeah. So it's kind of like a mix of things. So. Um, I'm sure one of these other guys will be able to talk about the, the concerns there. I can give a, like a, a little bit. It's like um, some of the main problems that we're trying to solve um, with responsive images as a whole is integrating nicely into how browsers load images and performance-wise. So um, to block and wait for a star sheet to download that will give you the instructions to then uh, be able to uh, fetch the files that you need will probably cause issues. Um, 
part of the stuff that you was talking about before about these um, CSS based um, variables that you can put in is that you would need to insert them at the top of the document inline so then they would actually parse before anything else. So there's like big performance issues with all this. So like it's a cool solution, um, but like the, now I'm not saying that it wouldn't work, but it's like working out how all the dynamics work there within the browser is pretty crazy. Does anyone want to add? Probably ones that add I just want to add that it's basically violating the separation of concerns from the other side of the spectrum. You're putting, uh, basically your, your content is now part of your presentation in, in a way because you, the content URLs rely on the, on the CSS. So you would have to either, I mean, for CSS caching, if you would, content images tend to change often. Um, everything that's in CSS usually changes, uh, I mean, less less often than that, so it can be cached for uh, for a while, for a long while. So it yeah, it's, it's, it 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 violates the the layers as far as I'm concerned, in a so way. Yeah, so let's let's take that one up. So I got another question from the audience, and another one from. Oh, so I got a couple here. I'm gonna go there first, and then I'll talk. Oh, we'll bounce to. Sorry, you already have the mic, so go ahead, and then I'll, I'll bounce to you. Sorry. Uh, just, just to counteract that, um, how you say if you need to download the CSS first in order to display the image, but if the CSS modifies the size of the image, which can modify the art direction and the actual one that you want to use, isn't that important? It is, <laughs> um, like I said, like it, it's all like a traits and balance kind of thing because you, you really, um, you know. We, we are trying to keep the performance high. So there is going to be a penalty for everything. So where you defer, like you were saying, the separation is a concern. It's, it's going to have issues with how the images are loaded and when. So if the things have to be deferred, then you, know, you might defer layout, and that's going to impact uh, the user's perception of whatever application you're trying to run. So it's, again, we need to test a lot of this stuff. We don't know. It's still like, even though we've been talking about it, now it's like really time to start testing some of it. So. I guess I just had more of a direct question for Peter. Sorry to put you on the spot. But given the kind of art direction perspective, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, y from your standpoint, what is best practice right now? Um, given that it's not all just programmers trying to do stuff in an automated fashion. Because every time I've tried to do that, I fail. And the art director looks at me and is like, no, we need to crop it this way instead. So, so I'm going to I want you to answer that. But I think this is a great question because it's really about you know what should developers be doing today, um, and I think like John has some ideas. Uh, Anne's already talked about you know let's try out this uh, progressive JPEGs you know and Yob and I have kind of been working on the standards trying to you know look forward. Uh, still has been kind of experimenting with the client count techniques. So by all means, so we have five minutes. So like one minute each. What can developers do today? Starting with Peter. Okay. Well, here's what we're doing. We're sending. Um, lots of the JPEG sources into the HTML as a JSON um, string on the on a data attribute. Um, we've got JavaScript running that um, will, uh, after the CSS has evaluated the layout, will pick the right source and apply it and on resize change it. Yeah, the performance isn't great for that, um, but the the to answer a little of what you have was saying that I think that having a default source there, low res. Your kind of your best guess is, I think, an okay way to go for what we have now. Okay, and on a, what, what, what do you recommend for developers? Um, I mean, I think that uh, yeah, what we have now is is a bunch of hacks, right? So um, we, that's what we have. <laughs> I think that we should try and focus. I, I, I love that we're doing this, and we're actually, I think what we're talking about are, are like big wins and solutions for responsive images. I think we should really be forward thinking and, um, you know, not forget all of the different options and all of our different paths and, and, and uh, explore them all. I think it's great. Um, I think that current, all current hacks uh, have uh, performance trade offs. All current hacks, uh, basically, you're deferring the loading of the image to a later time in order to download the appropriate appropriate one. I think that uh, things will look up sh soon. 
uh, things will get better soon with the there's a work there's currently work in the responsive images community group on an X picture polyfill that will like use web components. Yeah, that uses web components in order to emulate picture. It won't work with the preloader, but assuming if you don't have any blocking scripts at the page's top, it should have similar performance characteristics as image. So current hacks all have problems. Future hacks will get better. And hopefully, uh, and then there's a source set. Hopefully, it will ship soon enough. in a <laughs> default browser. I mean, in in a release build, release build soon enough. Okay. So I guess the question is, what developers should be doing now, and what developers should be doing now is being concerned about what they're sending over the wires and making sure that they're not sending huge assets to limited bandwidth devices. And in terms of what we should be doing, I I or or the spec authors should be doing is we should also, I think, what I haven't heard, and I just thought of while I was on stage, so I don't know, maybe it has been. Uh, there's some CSS, there's uh, the image element you can clip and pick certain areas. So maybe figuring out a way to to do that on the back end or through client hits so that you're actually just downloading based on that instead of downloading the whole image. Right, so th just expanding on that one. So it's basically just taking, you have your normal image, and then you select the area that you want to crop out, and basically you just crop it out with CSS. It's a good way of doing right. our direction. And it fits quite well with compressive images as well. Um, so we'll give several answers. Um, for CSS, you can just use media queries to switch out the right image. Uh, it's in a better state these days. For HTML, there's three different things. <laughs> um, for fixed size images, we're just switching based on the device pixel ratio. Um, compressive images, like serving a d double size but highly compressed image, is, is reasonable. Um, source set will be nice, but only once browsers support it. Um, for viewport based switching, where you need to take into account flexible images, um, I think the best solution these days is to load a very low quality placeholder, which you embed directly in your, well, which, you, which you directly reference from your HTML. And then uh, later on, using JavaScript, you swap it out with an appropriate resolution image based on the actual uh, image size or now whatever. Would you use the, the classic, I don't even know if this works for you, but like, there was like a, a low source, low SRC attribute on HTML? I, mean, I just use SRC, so put the low quality one in SRC and use JavaScript to replace that with a, a better quality one once you've loaded that in the background. Um, so you get kind of like this progressive thing where the page loads in low quality quickly and gradually becomes higher quality. Um, so I actually released a library for this yesterday. Uh, it's on github.com slash johnmeller slash respswap.js. <laughs> Very early stages. Um, finally, for art direction, where you actually need a different image rather than just a different resolution of the same image, um, you can't load a low-quality placeholder because you don't know what image it's going to be. And so for that, you can use something like picture fill or whatever. whatever. But don't use picture fill for viewport switching. So picture fill, just for people who don't know what that is, uh, so picture fill is a, poly you can Google it, you'll find it pretty quick. And it's basically um, the similar syntax to the picture element, uh, but done with divs and I think divs and, and spans or something. Uh, but it, it basically works. But the downside is that the images don't load until the, the page is f fully finished loading and you reach DOM content loaded. And so your images will start loading much later than if you've got like a placeholder or something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just to emphasize, emphasize on that, uh, yeah, picture fill should be used for our direction and not for uh, yeah, not yeah. for resolution switching. I'd, I'd like to add one yeah. comment because the picture fill, the reason that it's an issue is because it's on DOM, com DOM content loaded. We should make on DOM content loaded much faster. It shouldn't be taking 10 seconds to download your page. So and that's one thing we should definitely so work I think on as that one, I think we'll hopefully get covered in, uh, in one of the other sessions because that's part of the performance thing. So there is work around that that we would basically say, and I'm, I'm just wrapping up here for the session, but basically you would just say, um, my page is ready now. So you, as an author, you say, forget DOM content loaded, but page is done. And you send like a fake DOM content loaded event um, that indicates to the browser, you know, now I'm ready to do other stuff. So. Um, Please uh, join me in thanking the, the panel here. Uh.